Thank you, Karen. I hope my eyes work so I can read my paper. <laughs> um, so um, having lived and worked in Santa Fe, New Mexico for, um, and let me just check the, our time, okay. So having lived and worked in Santa Fe, New Mexico for seven years, I gained a superficial familiarity with the work of T.C. Cannon, um, but until now I haven't had the opportunity to take a closer look at his practice. And so um, I want to thank Karen for inviting me to participate on this panel um, and for the chance to give this work a little more consideration. So one of the questions that was uh, posed to me by Karen was to um, use T.C. Cannon as an example to think about how we as curators and historians of American art might go about um, the more thorough integration of Native American artists into the presentation and discussion of American art writ large. And so um, um, both um, Karen and um, Rachel in their presentations have thought about how we look at the sort of canonical arts of these um, periods of the 60s and 70s and see and has shown where Ken has affinities with these artists like Rauschenberg and Jim Dine and others. Um, but rather my approach is to start with the work of Canon or to start with the work of a Native American artist and to ask um, what questions and issues do these works raise and how that might restructure the way we think about American art in this period. And so what this does is it acknowledges that traditional presentations have biases that are built into them. So when you visit a museum and go into the, mu the modern contemporary art galleries um, or look at a textbook in American art up until very recently, you'll see that there are biases toward artists, for example, who are living and working on the coast, either in New York or LA, um, um, an, a bias toward white male artists, um, a bias toward a linear narrative progression of the history of art rather than thinking about a more kind of nodal um, representation. Um, and that also to think that this narrative that is produced is really developed from the artworks that are, ch are chosen to participate in that narrative. And so that it, the narrative then is kind of reinforcing the concerns that are being presented in those works. Um, and then, and therefore other kinds of works are by nature edited out of that narrative. Um, but this, um, let's see, okay, all right. So but there has been a lot of work done over the last several um, decades to kind of um, correct and sort of open up the expanse of, um, of, um, art, of, of American art, particularly um, I'm most familiar with sort of feminist and African American readings around this period. And I've just put up um, two examples of very recent exhibitions, like within the last year, that are focusing on the period in question, the uh, 1960s and 1970s, around um, the production of African American artists in this period. So on the left, you have um, Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power, which is currently um, touring the country. And then um, We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 19 65 to 85, um, which was on view at the Brooklyn Museum of Art last year. And so what these exhibitions are doing are kind of taking the work of African American artists as a starting point to kind of rethink the art history of these periods. So for example, you get um, <laughs> work like this. So on the left, we have Faith Ringel's Die from 1967, which is sort of directly engaging with the sort of civil unrest and violence that's happening in this period. Um, and this is in the Soul of a Nation exhibition. Um, and on the right is Elizabeth Catlett's Target from 1970, which is directly um, dealing with this issue of um, violence toward African Americans. So the 60s and the 70s in the hands of this artist could look like this rather than this. <laughs> um, Donald Judge, uh, <laughs> untitled from 1967. Okay. And so for me, um, one of the ways that curators, and I, I take this responsibility on myself as a curator, who are not specialists in Native American art, can um, begin to approach these works and think about how we integrate them into our practice, um, is one, to be humble enough to admit that we have blind spots, um, to be willing to look where we haven't looked before, um, and you know, you could be standing right next, I think being here in Salem and thinking of a nautical metaphor, like you could be standing next to the water, but if your back is to the harbor, you're not gonna see the boats, right? So where you position yourself and where you choose to look determines what you see. 
um, and to being committed to continuing to educate ourselves um, and to recognize the scholarship and the expertise that already exists in this field, particularly those being produced um, by specialists in Native American art and particularly Native curators and historians, um, and how like having someone either through collaborations or through um, hires of people whose fields um, may be within American art but who are coming from di different perspectives might reimagine um, this canon. Um, and so for me, um, I'm trained as a historian in American art, but I practice primarily as a curator of contemporary art, and I work mostly with living artists. Um, and so um, uh, for me, it was really um, my time in Santa Fe where I um, discovered my own blind spot in regards to Native American art, history, and contemporary practice, and that's where I made this commitment to continued education. And so when I moved there, um, I began you know, visiting exhibitions at the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts, which is um, affiliated where IAIA, where Canon is an alumni. Um, and that you know, program, and I realized that my knowledge of contemporary Native arts was limited to artists who had gained recognition um, in the kind of height of an interest in multiculturalism in the late 80s and 90s, like James Luna. Um, and so, and that I had had a very um, kind of New York-centric view in my, in my own practice. Um, and so, and I also saw within Santa Fe as well that there had been this great divide between the art worlds that intersected with the institution that I worked at um, versus um, those that were um, circulating around the Native arts community and sort of thinking about how do you um, um, break down those walls and bridge those gaps. Um, so what I wanted to do today was to um, talk about just one of my previous um, exhibition projects that attempted to do this, starting with the work of a Native artist, um, and then end with some um, kind of propositions about where we might go with this in terms of the work of T.C. Cannon. Okay, so in the um, end of 2015, I began working on an exhibition that would become If You Remember, I'll Remember. Um, the exhibition was presented in 2017 at the Block Museum of Art at Northwestern University, where I currently work, um, and it included the work of seven contemporary artists, Christina Ono, Shan Gorson, Samantha Hill, um, McCallum and Terry, uh, Dario Roberto, and Marie Watt. The exhibition, if you remember or I'll remember, um, was an invitation to reflect on the past while contemplating the present through works of art um, ex that explored themes of love, mourning, war, relocation, internment and resistance and civil rights in 19th and 20th century North America. By engaging with historic documents, photographs, sound recordings, and oral histories, and objects of material culture drawn from institutional and informal archives, the artists included in the exhibition highlight individual stories um, or made connections with their own histories. And some of these works were very specifically linked to um, particular events um, or made expi uh, explicit connections kind of across time periods, um, while in others it was a more of an implicit association. Um, and my kind of goal with this was to juxtapose themes and histories that are rarely considered in relationship to each other within American art, even though they might be concurrent. Um, and um, to kind of pose questions about the purpose and processes of remembering and our responsibilities to remember. And so and this work was also very much um, kind of uh, influenced by this contemporary um, political events that were happening around that time. So one of the starting points um, for me was the work of Portland-based Seneca artist Marie Watt, um, whose work I believe is in the Peabody Essex Museum's collection, or she's present, she has exhibited here before. Um, and I had actually first encountered her work in an exhibition in Santa Fe at the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, Native Arts um, and had worked with her previously on a project at Site Santa Fe. So this is just an installation view of a wider treatment of her work. Um, her work is um, sort of hanging um, here um, in this exhibition, Unsuspected Possibilities, with artists um, Leonardo Drew and Sarah Oppenheimer. Um, it's just another installation view for scale um, of these works. And then there's Marie on the left with the other artists in the exhibition, Leonardo Drew and Sarah Oppenheimer and myself, which will go away from that, it's a bad picture. <laughs> um, 
and the work is just to see the work of Leonardo Drew um, and then Sarah ha Oppenheimer's architectural interventions, which kind of collapsed the space so that you could see the work of these artists in the same frame. Um, so, but with, if you, um, and this is just for you remember, I'll remember, and again, um, the artists that were in this exhibition. Okay, and so this is the work that I started with. Um, it's a work entitled Witness from 2015. And so the potential of everyday art objects to spark memory and inspire narrative of Marie Watt's practice, um, which is heavily influenced by indigenous and particularly Seneca principles of bio, um, biography, oral tradition, and history, and the wide-ranging functions and associations with, of blankets, um, which, um, for example, in Seneca culture are given as gifts to those who have um, witnessed important events, um, have been a potent material for the artist. And so Marie Watt's witness was inspired by a photograph that Watt encountered in the Royal British Columbia Museum and Archives. The photograph depicted a 1913 Kwamachan potlatch near Vancouver Island. And one of the key aspects of potlatch, um, which is a very complex and multifaceted tradition, is a redistribu redistribution of wealth within the community. And Watt was struck by the fact that the potlatch could be interpreted as an act of civil disobedience, um, as these gatherings were banned by both the Canadian and American governments from the 1880s to 1950s. So in Witness, um, Watt has reinterpreted the image on a cinematic scale, so you can kind of see, oh, whoops, the pointer. Oh, no, I'm not gonna be that lucky. Oh, here we go. So you can see here, um, this part of the um, image is based on the, uh, on the photograph, and she's interpreted at kind of a cinematic scale on this double-wide um, Hudson's Bay trade blanket. But here she's inserted herself and her two daughters um, functioning as contemporary witnesses to this historic event. Um, Watt also credits the Black Lives Matter movement that, um, that was um, developing um, at the time that she was working on this um, piece as an influence on some of her compositional choices. So in the original photograph, which um, um, hands are outstretched as they reach for the blanket that a host family, um, let's see. No, twice in a row, we're gonna be lucky, Emma. Um, no, okay, well, there's a blanket you can kind of see that's flying through the air in the original photographs. The hands are outstretched um, to sort of grab it, but in um, Watt's interpretation, she's more emphasized that the hands are kind of more in this fist gesture um, to kind of emphasize um, this aspect of, um, you know, a protest or against injustice. And so, like, starting with Marie's work as a starting point, um, I emerged that there was this concern with history concerned with archives, with protests and civil, uh, civil disobedience, but also thinking about cultural continuums, generational legacies, um, and a certain kind of materiality and labor in our artistic practice. And so um, I look to others who engage with uh, similar concerns. And so here, Thanks. Um, you can just see an overall um, installation shot of the exhibition with Marie's work in the background. Um, in the foreground, um, and the pedestals of work of uh, Eastern Cherokee artist Shan Gorsan, um, Daro Blerto on the gray wall, and then the large wall in the back is a work by Christina Iono. And I'll just talk briefly about a couple of these artists to give you a sense of the connections that were made. Um, it's just another overview. So, for example, Christine Iono um, contributed a work entitled The Nail That Sticks Up the Farthest. Um, and the title um, comes from a Japanese um, um, proverb, Derekugi wa Uterero, which translates to The Nail That Sticks Up the Farthest Takes the Most Pounding. Um, and um, as if this is a reprisal of a work that Iono had done in um, 1992 to mark the 50th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, in which President Roosevelt called for the internment um, of over 120,000 um, Japanese Americans um, who were living on the West Coast at that time. And um, in this work, um, Iono, um, you can see it's about a 40-foot installation. And what it is, is it's made up of um, 
the background kind of wallpaper are all um, photocopies of documents um, the, that were taken from the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians that was hold, held between 1980 and 1983 to um, revisit um, this history of internment um, and ended up in redress for Japanese Americans. And so these are the testimony of all of the former internees um, who spoke at that commission. Um, laid on top of that is a grid of 120,313 holes, one for each person who was interned. And then the rusted nails um, that were used to kind of create the pattern of the American flag. Um, and this is, and it was an interactive work in which half of the nails were included at the beginning of the exhibition. Um, and then at the, um, during the course of the period, people were invited to add nails and remembrance to those who had passed on. Okay. Maybe next. Here we go. Um, also included, as I said, was the work of Shan Gorsan. Um, here pictured is her work, Cherokee Burden Basket, Singing a Song for Balance. Um, and actually, as a result of this exhibition, we were able to acquire this piece, so it's now part of our permanent collection. Um, and after many years of working as a painter and photographer, the Eastern Band Cherokee artist and activist Shan Gorsan turned to basket weaving around 2008 as her primary mode of expression. And her conceptual baskets combined Cherokee aesthetics with thought-provoking content, including historical photographs and text. Here's uh, um, two examples of the works, and then these are details um, of them that um, address links between historical events and ongoing struggles for Native American sovereignty and self-determination. Several of these works reference the fraught history of treaties between the U.S. government and Native nations, as well as the history of the Carlisle Indian Industrial Boarding School um, and related schools. Um, so Cherokee Burden Basket, which was the piece we saw in the detail of that is on the right, um, employs a traditional form of Eastern Cherokee um, basket, a variation of um, two patterns known as Chief's Daughter and Unbroken Friendship. And the basket would be used to carry heavy loads such as produce or um, firewood. And so the artist's also choice of the burden basket form underscores other types of burdens carried by Native people that are referenced in the work. Um, and then the detail on the left is um, from a piece called Prayers for Our Children, which is referencing the history of the Carlisle Indian Boarding School. And the, it's a photograph that's taken from the archives um, of that school that are um, held by the Smithsonian, where it's a kind of a large kind of class um, uh, photo of uh, children who attended the school. And woven through the rest of the basket um, are their names and um, their uh, nation affiliations. Um, also um, included in this exhibition, I'm gonna move along, um, were work by Samantha Hill, who is an um, African-American artist who's based in Chicago, and the ways in which personal narratives, and who's also kind of um, interested in the photography, and so the ways in which personal narratives intersects with moments of historical importance have long been a preoccupation of hers. And since 2009, Hill had been developing um, a project called the Kinship Project Archive, which is a repository comprising um, um, oral histories and over 3,000 objects, including vintage photographs and scrapbooks, mostly from African-American families, obtained primarily through Hill's in-depth engagement with various communities, um, particularly in Anchorage, Charlotte, um, and Chicago. And they become um, sort of inspiration for different performances and public presentations and installations. And so this particular piece, um, Herbarium, um, was inspired by um, a collection from a family in Hyde Park um, in Chicago. Uh, one of the family's ancestors had been a prominent African-American physician and community developer in Birmingham, Alabama. And he was involved um, early on in the growth of the Birmingham uh, 16th Street Baptist Church, which was founded in 1873. But it was a church that um, became a nationally charged strike in 1963 when members of the Ku Klux Klan bombed it, killing um, four girls um, aged 11 to 14. And in this work, um, Hill has sort of made these historic connections between these killings and contemporary um, 
um, death of black youth. So in this sort of memorial, it's kind of an altar to her children. She's created these ghost-like images. And then in the kind of cup there, um, she um, is equating kind of the deaths of these four little girls to the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and Trayvon Martin in um, Florida. So um, for most of my career, and so in the project that I just talked about, um, I've had the benefit of working with living artists. And so turning now to canon, I wanted to think about how um, we might take a similar approach. So thinking about um, taking a clue from his works and the archives that we left behind, what are other artists, what are some of the concerns that we see in Cannon's work um, that um, have, um, and what kind of other artists would have affinities with them? So um, I chose to focus on just to kind of look at a few of his self-portraits, um, which um, we have to discuss where uh, so on the left, you have a self-portrait in front of a village with the atomic bomb that's undated, that's in the um, exhibition, um, and collector number two. And so here you're seeing that there is this um, self-possessed, self-confident, um, frontal, and kind of direct um, address that is um, you see throughout can canon self-portraits, but also these kind of clue to other aspects of his identity and his interests. So for example, in the back, it's been noted that um, his interest um, in artists like Vincent van Gogh, and he's sort of including um, one of his photos, one of his um, paintings in this. And similarly, um, this atomic bomb um, and his self-portrait in the studio um, again, is a similar kind of um, presentation with the landscape of New Mexico through the back window. And so in Karen's essay for, the, for this catalog, she references the way in which um, T.C. Cannon's sort of engagement with figural representation is in line with some of the artists, other artists working in the period. Um, for example, Barclay Hendricks, whose work we saw on the cover of the Soul of the Nation catalog. And like Cannon, Barclay Hendricks also engaged in um, many sort of self-representations of himself as an artist, but also um, of thinking about how to create a kind of um, self um, self-possessed representation that was much about himself as an artist, but also being kind of black figure on, on the canvas. Um, I also, in thinking about um, figural um, representation and thinking about the relationships between canons um, invoking of particular history, so there's this wonderful um, relationship that's made between Ken's collector number three and Ong's Odalisque in the exhibition and um, the sort of formal structure of these poses but thinking like again how someone like Hendrix, Barclay Hendrix is um, revising and revamping these classical painting ideals in their work um, but also uh, similar, similar attentions to um, pattern and detail in their compositions. Um, and then the other thing that um, I was really drawn to in the work of Cannon was this recurring motif of the mushroom cloud. Um, and this is a visual trope that's associated with the detonation of the atomic bomb in 1945. And in Cannon's work, it has traditionally been interpreted as a stand-in for the destruction caused by war and particularly impacted by Cannon's experience serving in Vietnam. Um, and this interest, um, this history has a global impact, but it also has a very specific um, impact and interest for the many artists who have lived in or spent significant time in New Mexico, right? And so it's not, um, you know, just to argue that for Cannon it's kind of standing in for this destruction, but also placing him as someone who spent there, how might we think about um, a kind of way of thinking of this visual trope as something that's related, tied to that particular place that's seen in the work of other artists. And so as one example, um, oh, th oh, these are just other images how this motif appears in Cannon's work. Um, but for one example, thinking of the um, photographer Patrick Nagatani, who recently passed, um, who taught at the University of New Mexico for two decades, um, taking work, this is a little bit later than Cannon's, um, from his nuclear enchantment series that was particularly interested in the way, the legacy of the development of the atomic bomb in New Mexico and its kind of continued presence in the landscape. Um, so on the left is a Trinitite Ground Zero Trinity site in New Mexico, um, and on the right, um, Fitness Cicla, the Bat Flight Amphitheater, Carlsbad Caverns. So, so they, um, thinking about these kind of apocalyptic um, representations that are um, tied specifically to the development of the atomic bomb. Um, and also, um, 
tied to that, this sort of prevalence of in the of the experience of being in Vietnam and the impact of that on Cannon's work. And so how might we think about that as a as a way um, into thinking about artwork of this decade. So um, two of um, Cannon's contemporaries, um, Terry Allen, who was born in 1943, um, who also um, now lives, who lives and works in Santa Fe, is also a singer and songwriter and poet and artist like Cannon. Um, his multimedia installation, of Youth in Asia from the Left, that was grappling with the aftermath of um, the effect of the Vietnam War on soldiers who return. Um, one passage um, in this work sort of states that the number of suicides by Vietnam veterans is double the number of those who um, died in the conflict, and where is the memorial for that? So wanting to construct, thinking about that lasting legacy. Um, or of work like Carolee Schneemann, of, uh, this is a, a still from a 16 millimeter film from 1968 entitled Viet Flakes, which is a montage of um, images that were coming out of, out of the war and grappling with that. And so with that, um, I just want to say that uh, this title of this paper um, is entitled um, Can the Cannon Burst? And it comes from a um, article, a sort of series of articles in the 1996 issue of the Art Bulletin, which is kind of the journal of record for um, the um, College Art Association that was part of a wave of scholarship that was rethinking um, how you might rethink the canon. And so I just offer these as a suggestions to think about rather than um, rethinking the canon, can the canon, can the canon burst, can we um, create um, a multi-nodal way of thinking about this art history that isn't con contained by just one linear narrative. Thank you. <laughs>